wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers, I'm going to ask you to stand up and come forward so we can make some space. Rahimallahu man dhakar al qa'ima min ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Please come forward as much as you can. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim <coughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen Habibi ilahi al-alameen Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad Sayyidi. <laughs> فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد An important theme of Islamic eschatology, as per the testimony of the Qur'an and the Hadith, is that mankind is in a state of a descending trajectory. Wal-Asr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرٍ Verily, man is at loss. And according to the hadith of the Prophet, is that man or mankind is in an overall descending or declining trajectory. However, even though there are, even though that mankind is in a state of decline, in a declining trajectory, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, inna rab, inna rabbaka That surely your Lord is looking and He is watching out. There are people who are chosen and guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve, to honor, and to, re to revive the practices of the Sunnah and of the Quran. And that's why even though Muslims and people of other faiths as well, are in agreement that, that mankind is in a downhill trajectory, that there will come a time where there will appear a muslih, one who will revive, one who will revolutionize, one who will restore and reconcile the abandoned teachings of the Qur'an and the abandoned teachings of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim ajma'een and in our school of thought, it is the hidden Imam, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajrallah Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. The decline or the disintegration of Islam or the Islamic Empire is something which has been discussed and noted by Muslim scholars and non Muslim scholars alike. It's something that they have concern themselves with. What are the problems of the Muslim Ummah? Where do we start? Now, with Muslims, there have been, there have been times where, where, where conventions and gatherings have been convened in order to discuss what the problems of the Muslim Ummah are. It's nothing that's, that's new. It's something which has been around for centuries. 
1899, a group of Muslim scholars got together in Mecca from all over the world. And they asked that question, what is the cause of the disintegration of the Muslim Empire, the Muslim Ummah today? And they came up with 57 reasons. 57 reasons. Now Muslims aren't the only ones to point out the problems within Islam or what is perceived to be the problems in Islam, but they are in, in reality they are, they are problems with the Muslim Ummah and not with Islam. Muslims have, uh, non-Muslims have also pointed these problems out. And this is where Western historians came and Orientalists and they pointed the finger at Muslims. They said, these people, you know, it's, it's their fault. The reason why the world is in turmoil, it's their fault. Now, what did these people say? And what they said, was it true or was it not? Because, because what the Quran says, the Quran affirms that man is at loss. But what Western historians and what Orientalists say, does it apply? I'll give you an example. One of the people who wrote about the disintegration of Islam was a man by the name of Samuel Zwemer. This man was American born and raised and educated as a seminarian. And then when he received his license, his degree to preach, he went overseas. He went to the Middle East and he spent a lot of time in Arabia. He spent some time in Arabia, he spent some time in Iraq, in Bahrain, and he spent some time in Egypt as well as a Christian missionary. When he came back, he delivered a series of lectures which he called the disintegration of Islam. And then these were published in a book. What does this man have to say about the disintegration of Islam? And does it apply? When you first open this book, and this was written in 1915, 1916, he says the following. If you remember yesterday, we said that there's a certain way to approach interfaith and intrafaith dialogue. One way not to approach is that when you have pre-existing biases and you're trying to confirm those biases. So what do you do? You seek out other religions. From his first sentence, he says the following about Islam. He says that just like every other non-Christian tradition and philosophy, Islam is a dying religion. I'll repeat that. Just like every non-Christian religion or philosophy, Islam is a dying religion. So what does that mean? I'm a Christian. Or let's say me, I'm a Muslim. And this is the problem when we forget about being right and we become righteous, we become self-righteous. Is that we see ourselves as the top, we can't learn anything from anyone, we see ourselves as superior, and then we begin to compare and contrast. My religion, we take the, the, the noblest and the loftiest concepts in our religion and we compare them with the most horrible concepts of other religions. And we call that a, a fair judgment and a fair comparison. He says the following. He says, one of the reasons behind the disintegration of Islam today is the dead weight of tradition. Tradition is a dead weight. And he gives some examples. I won't give all the ex examples, but just a few. He says that because of tradition, because Muslims see an importance to their tradition, these, these, the rules that are written out in, in tradition, they are by medieval standards. They're unapplicable and they keep Islam behind and there's no progression in Islam. And he cites a few examples. He cited a newspaper, a contemporary newspaper at the time, which gave examples of jurisprudential questions. Sometimes you'll find in a magazine, jurisprudential questions. For instance, if it's, if it's Ramadan, people will ask uh, what breaks the fast and what doesn't break the fast. Or if it's during the Hajj season, people will ask uh, what is the expiation if a person, for instance, kills a, kills a fly or if he, if he uproots a tree or something. Questions. He says, look at the following questions. And this shows you this person's ignorance. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you, a room full of Muslims today, is number one, so that we know what some people are thinking about us, 
Now, when I say these things, you're, you'll probably know the answer right away. You'll know the argument against it. But number two, there's something which is underlying here. Because some of these polemics, some of these criticisms, they apply to the Muslim Ummah today in one way or another. And how do we treat them? He says the following. He says, look at the questions, the ridiculous questions, which are being asked in these jurisprudential magazines. Some people are asking that we know that wine, it is forbidden to consume wine. However, does this mean that wine is impure? Can a person touch the wine or not? He sees this as a completely ridiculous question. Baba, what does it matter? This is what he's thinking. What does it matter what, whether it is pure or, or whether it is impure? Now, what's the question? For us, purity and impurity is very important. And the way that we purify ourselves with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the way that we purify our wealth by, for instance, paying a charity, paying zakat, we also have to purify our bodies. We have to purify our bodies. So purity is extremely important. Now what does he say? Why does he pose these questions? He's saying that look at the Muslims. They don't give, important, they don't give importance to heavy matters, but they worry about what is impure and what is pure. What can we touch and what can we not touch? This is one. Number two, he says, look at the following question. They're asking whether women should be taught how to read and write. And when people attack Islam in this way, it's not just, it's not just uh, you know, Orientalists, it's not just Christian polemics. This happens with atheists as well. This happens with anyone who is looking from the outside and wants to learn about the religion but does not want to learn from the tradition. There's a lot of dishonesty which is happening here. If you look at the world, if you look at the United States, when did women begin entering schools? It was only a few decades ago. So how can we judge a society where people are asking whether women are allowed to receive an education when, when education for women is something which is new in our society? So what's the answer? Number one, this is induction. What's induction? Induction is when you take a few examples and you try to reach uh, a, universal, a universal result. So if I begin asking people here, I point out, I say, do you like bananas? One person says yes. I point to another person, do you like bananas? Yes. The third person, fourth person, fifth person, sixth person. If I ask 10 people and they all say we like bananas, I can say, okay, well, by way of logic, by way of induction, everyone in this room likes bananas. Is that true? No, it's probably people who hate bananas. They never touch them. That's called induction. It's when you try to arrive, in Arabic, it's called istiqra. When you try to arrive at a universal conclusion, but you haven't done enough research. Of course, when you pick and choose a tradition, what you like, you take the noblest and the loftiest concepts in your religion and you Compare them to traditions which you do not understand. Of course, you're going to get this kind of, the, uh, you're going to reach this kind of conclusion. That's number one. Induction is speculative. It doesn't give you a definite answer. Number two, that in order to be able to properly criticize hadith, you have to have knowledge of hadith criticism. And, and this is what people, and this is a lesson not, to, not only to non-Muslims, to Muslims as well, is that there are people, scholars, who spend their life, 50, 60, some of them 70 years, dedicating their life to the knowledge of hadith criticism. It is for them to distinguish what is relevant and what is not relevant, what is authentic and what is, uh, and what is not authentic. And that's why some Muslims fell into this pit. It wasn't only this man, it wasn't only Samuel Zwemer. Some Muslims also fell into this pit. That they looked at tradition and they found a few traditions which they didn't understand, a few ahadith which they didn't understand, and then they came to this universal judgment that all of tradition is completely irrelevant. So I'll give you an example. I mentioned this last week, but we didn't go in detail. Fatima Marnisi. Fatima Marnisi is a French-educated Moroccan woman who says that Islam needs to be reformed radically. Why? And she is among the people who are, who are labeled as modernists. All in the name of modernity, 
we need to lose interpretive control. We need to allow people who have no expertise, let them interpret the tradition. And what happens? What happened with Christianity when we lost interpretive control? The Thirty Years' War. 25% of Germany completely gone during the Protestant Reformation because people lost interpretive control. She says the following. She says, and she's among the people that take the Qur'an only. You know, let's take the Qur'an and only a few hadith. The vast majority of hadith needs to be rejected because hadith were, 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 were transmitted by men and men are misogynists. They're very biased. She takes a couple of examples. She takes two people. One is Abu Huraira. She says Abu Huraira was the biggest misogynist. She presents one hadith, and this, this hadith, this hadith is not authentic. But some of these hadith existed. Now everything that Abu Huraira said was authentic, no one's claiming that every single thing that Abu Huraira said was authentic. What's found in books which are authentic, now in, in, in Shia Islam it's even more criticized, but in Sunni Islam, what is found in, in, in uh, uh, books which are, are proven to be authentic, then we take them as authentic. She narrates one hadith and she says, look at this misogynist. We can't depend on anything that he says. He narrates a hadith that says that if you are praying, supposedly Rasulullah said this. Rasulullah never said this. Supposedly, Rasulullah said that if you are praying, there are three things that can in invalidate your prayers if they, if they walk in front of you. One is a donkey, one is a black dog, and the third is a woman. If they walk in front of you, that's it, they invalidate your prayers. She says, look at this misogynist. Now again, I repeat, this hadith is not authentic. And then she deducts that this man is not trustworthy, we can't take his hadith. This tradition is completely dead weight. And then she takes another man, another narrator, Abu Bakr, not to be confused with Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, he was a narrator of hadith, he narrates a hadith, supposedly from Rasulullah, that says that if a nation, if a, na a nation which uh, basically places its management and its command with a woman, this nation shall not flourish. And she says that Abu Bakr narrated this after the Battle of Jamal. The Battle of Jamal, on one side you had Imam Ali alayhi salam, on the other side you had Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. He wanted to buy in with Imam Ali alayhi salam, so he narrated this. Let's see how many people died during the first civil war, during the battle of Jamal? That women aren't to be trusted. So he narrates this fabricated hadith. It's not that easy. The hadith isn't authentic, but it's not that easy. Just because you determine that this person might be a misogynist, or this person, you know, he, he, he was this or that. The person was trustworthy, he was trustworthy. He wasn't trustworthy, he wasn't trustworthy. And this... Here, people say, this is what contributed to the disintegration of Islam. These narrations. Okay. Now, what is the answer? What is the answer to Muslims? The answer to Muslims. Here, we find an irony. Imam Hussein alayhi salam detected this irony. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet and the cousin of Imam Ali alayhi salam, also detected this irony. See, sometimes we become involved with things which are so small and then we completely forget about the big picture. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When Abdullah ibn Abbas was asked. Now this, this is something, this is an attitude which legitimately can be held amongst some Muslims. When we talk about the disintegration of Islam through tradition, one of the things which falls under the category of the disintegration of Islam, because this man, Zwemer, this is one of the things that he says, is that Muslims neglect the big picture because of this, and he proves this through, through uh, through, through the tradition. He says that Muslims are so obsessed with tradition is that they begin to neglect the big picture. Abdullah ibn Abbas, after the battle of Karbala, and Abdullah ibn Abbas was a scholar, they came to him, they said the following. They said that what is the expiation 
of a person who during the Hajj in the state of Ihram kills a bug. What's that person's expiation, the kafara, the penalty that he has to pay? He told them, and the people who asked him were Kufans, the ones who deceived Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He told them the following. He said that you're asking me about the expiation of killing a bug. He said, what kind of audacity is this? What kind of irony is this? Is this? You had no problem slaughtering the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam, and now you're asking me about what the expiation of a bug is? This attitude, this legitimately reflects the disintegration of Islam. Is that when we pay attention to small matters, to small details, but we completely reject the larger picture. A lot of people, you go to different countries, and the way that they, they act, the way that they, they conduct themselves, some societies, you see that they pay attention to the smallest details, which may or may not be authentic, which may or may not be true, may or may not be reflective of Islamic jurisprudence, but they completely miss the bigger picture. You go to some places, they'll tell you that your beard has to be this long, and your robe has to be this short, but those very same places have the worst human rights records. They've forgotten the big picture of Islam, and they've paid attention to these very small details. And this is an irony. This is why Ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas reprimands them. You're telling me about a bug while you killed the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This attitude is reflective of the disintegration of Islam. Now the way that he brings it, this Zwemer guy, he says that Muslims, they don't care about the bigger picture. They care about the small things. To an extent, this is true. We have to be able to accept criticism. Not in the form that he says it, because he, he rants, he, he leaves this, this horrible argument behind. But we must not pay, pay attention to the details while missing the big picture. And we should not do the exact opposite as well. Sometimes, we look at the big picture, but we forget about the details. It's important to pay attention to the details. Some people, they believe that their cause is so great that they're willing to forego every single detail. It's okay. Some guy tried to prove the following to me. He said, Sayyid. It was in a community and they were trying to raise funds for a masjid. He said, Sayyid, I heard that when it comes to building a masjid, this is such a great cause, that you can even steal money. You could use money that is stolen. And he, was, he, was, he was really excited about it. This doesn't happen just because the cause is great doesn't mean you can completely abandon the details. The hadith says, لا يطاع الله من حيث يحصى, That God is not obeyed through means in which He is dis disobeyed. I have a goal that I want to accomplish. I want to build an Islamic center. I want to build an orphanage. I want to build a, 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 home, a, a homeless shelter in the name of Islam. I have a great cause that I want to establish. But I'm willing to break every rule of Islam. I'm willing to break every rule of society in order to accomplish that. Does that work? It doesn't work. We can't abandon the big picture and pay attention to the small details, focus only on the small details, and we can't do the exact opposite. There has to be a holistic approach. And this is what the Imams of Ahlul Bayt taught us. There is a concept in Islam which is known as maqasid. Maqasid refers to the higher objectives of the Sharia. And they're different in Shia Islam and Sunni Islam. The reason I bring this up is because of this Orientalist approach. There are higher objectives which are taken into consideration with the establishment of the Sharia. Now in Sunni Islam, there are five, uh, there are five maqasid, five higher objectives which the Sharia is supposed to protect and accomplish. They are faith, life, lineage, intellect, and property. These represent the supreme law. In the same way that you look at the United States Constitution, you look at federal law, the United States Constitution represents the supreme law. So if individual laws are created, they can't go against that supreme law, correct? The idea with the maqasid, the higher objectives, the theory of higher objectives, is that the sharia has higher objectives, the protection of life, 
the protection of intellect, the protection of property, the protection of wealth, all of those are the higher objectives. Whatever is wajib, whatever is haram, whatever is mustahab, whatever is makruh, all of that is to establish, maintain, and protect these higher objectives. This is in Sunni Islam. In Shia Islam, it's different. We have, as a pillar of our faith, we have five pillars. Number one is what? Tawheed. We believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, and this is the one I want to make a point of, is what? Adl, justice. The binding justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three is what? Nubuwa, the belief in the prophethood. Number four, imama, the belief in the imams, the continuation of the prophethood. And number five is what? Ma'ad, the belief in the hereafter. Number one and number three and number five are required for Islam. So the belief in the oneness of Allah, they are required for us, is required for Islam. The belief in the prophethood, this is a requirement for Islam. And the belief in the hereafter is also a requirement of Islam. Number two and number four are not a requirement of Islam, rather they are a requirement of Iman, of faith. And that is the belief in the divine justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the belief in the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Number two, and that is justice, represents the higher objective. Instead of these five higher objectives, we have one higher objective, and that is justice. Any law which is created cannot go against the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any law which is created cannot go against the, 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 the common notion or the common understanding of justice within a society or within a government. Justice is the basis of all action. Justice is the basis of all law. Sometimes we forego our higher objectives. If we forget about justice, if we forget that the basis of this entire universe, the basis of Islamic law is justice, then we're in trouble. When we try to justify the ends through wrong means, when we try to justify the means through an end, that's when we're in trouble. And Imam Hussein salam detected this. He detected this irony. And this is why he stood up against the rule of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Islam was completely lost. The higher objectives were completely lost. So this is one thing, the dead weight of tradition. Number two is what he considers even greater. He speaks about the concept of greater sins. We all hear about greater sins, right? What are the greater sins? Murder is considered a great sin. Theft is considered a great sin. Adultery is considered a great sin. Blasphemy is also considered a great sin. He says, look at these Muslims, look at how ridiculous they are. He said, because they've placed a distinction between greater sins and lesser sins, they've, told, they've convinced themselves that as long as you refrain from the greater sins, you're okay. So you can indulge in the lesser sins as much as you want. Now this is a complete lie, because nobody who believes in the greater sins believes that you can indulge in lesser sins as much as you want. However, there is a problem. Now those who believe, the scholars who believe in the greater sins, what do they say? They say that what is considered a lesser sin, if it becomes frequent, that turns into a greater sin. So no, a person cannot indulge in lesser sins as much as he wants. Because if he indulges in lesser sins, that becomes a greater sin. The Quran does speak about greater sins. In tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tunhawna anhu, nukaffira ankum sayyi'atikum. He says in Surah An-Nisa that if you refrain from the greater sins, the abominations, then we will forgive. Sometimes, and we're all fallible, none of us are infallible, we'll engage in what we call the lesser sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that as long as that does not get out of control, and as long as it does not become repetitive, as long as that is followed by repentance, and once you have been forgiven, you make 
a pact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to turn back to that, then we will forgive your sins because we are merciful. God is trying to say that I won't hold every single tiny thing against you. I'll forgive your sins. I'm willing. This is an expression of the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. Number two, not all scholars believe in the greater sins. Because any sin, see, don't look at how small or how large your sin is. Don't look at it in that way. Don't measure your disobedience on a scale. And if it's, you know, if it's below a certain point, it's okay. If it's above a certain point, it's not okay. Look at whom you are disobeying. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put that into perspective. Once you put that into perspective, then there will be no such thing as a greater sin or a lesser sin. Any time you want to disobey, this is considered an act of tajarri, an act of audacity, which is punishable. If I drink this water with the intention of it being alcohol and it turns out to be water, what happens? Am I punished or am I not punished? Some scholars say that you are punished. They argue that you are punished. Why? Merely having the nerve and having the audacity, and I drank it with the intention of it being alcohol, that reveals your disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's enough to merit punishment. In this regard, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. See, one, one problem when we, when we begin to weigh our sins and say this is great and that is not great, that's a result of forgetting about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches us in every moment. أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا يَكُونُ مِن نَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ Do you not know that Allah hears everything which goes on in the universe? There is not a time, the Quran says, when three people gather to, to discuss among themselves and God is not the fourth. And when five people gather, and God is not the sixth. God is there all the time. When we begin to measure our sins and say, this is small and this is big, we begin to forget the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. What does it matter whether it is small or big? Allah is witnessing. And He writes down, everything is written in an illuminous book. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, he says here, عَمِيَتْ عَيْنُ لَا تَرَاكَ عَلَيْهَا رَقِيبًا He says, an eye, which does not recognize the fact that you are watching over it all the time, this eye is, is surely blind. It's completely blind. An eye that forgets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there watching and recording through the angels every single act, this eye is completely blind. In reality, we shouldn't measure our sins as small or great. All of our sins are great. We should, we should, every once in a while, we should revise our intentions. If we want Islam to prosper, it begins with our behavior. It begins with our attitude. It doesn't begin with the attitude of others. It doesn't begin with how people are going to see us, how Orientalists are going to see us, how Westerners are going to see us. None of that is going to matter. Their opinion does not matter. What matters is our self-critique of ourselves, holding ourselves accountable. عَمِيَتْ عَيْنٌ لَا تَرَاكَ عَلَيْهَا رَقِيبًا Imam Hussain alayhi salam, in his time, he truly witnessed the disintegration of Islam. He saw Islam going on a downhill trajectory. And just to give you a, a, a taste, just to depict who the Banu, Banu Umayyah were, the Banu Umayyah were people who wanted to establish an Arab monarchy. They had nothing to do with Islam. Beginning with Muawiyah and ending with the last one. The last one, who they referred to as Marwan al-Himar because of his mismanagement. He knew he didn't know how to manage and that's why they lost it to the Abbasis. One of them who was known for his perversion and his licentiousness was a man by the name of Al-Walid ibn Yazid. Beautiful name, huh? Al-Walid ibn Yazid. Al-Walid ibn Yazid, who they refer to as, they used to refer to as Amir al-Mu'mineen, just to show you the, the, where Islam had reached by that time. 
one of his feats when he came to the Kaaba, when he came to Mecca, was that he had a winery, a distillery built on top of the Kaaba. So that when Amir al-Mu'mineen comes to the, to, to the Umrah or the Hajj and to perform Tawaf, he can enjoy his drink. Al-Walid ibn Yazid one day is reading the Qur'an. I know, reading the Qur'an, very ironic. He was reading the Qur'an and he comes across the following verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the dictators and how every single dictator will be destroyed in one way or another. Dictators do not stand in the politics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He opened the verses in Surah Ibrahim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَاسْتَفْتَحُوا وَخَابَ كُلُّ جَبَّارٍ عَنِيدٍ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَيُسْقَى مِنْ مَاءٍ صَدِيدٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says every jabbar, every arrogant dictator, every arrogant tyrant will surely fall one day. And what is waiting after his fall is even worse. And that is the boiling hellfire on the Day of Judgment. مِنْ وَرَائِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَيُسْقَى مِنْ مَاءٍ صَدِيدٍ He took it as a personal threat. He knows he's a dictator, he knows he's arrogant, and he knows he's evil. And this is the one they call Amir al mumini He places the Qur'an on a mantle, and he decides he wants uh, target practice. So he gets a bow and arrow, and he begins to shoot at the Qur'an. And he begins to recite poetry. He says, you, 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 uh, you point the finger at me for being a dictator. Yes, I am a dictator and I am arrogant. And if you come to your Lord on the day of judgment, tell him that Al-Walid was the one who tore me into pieces. 60 years after Islam, the trajectory of Muslims and the disintegration of Islam is plummeting. And this is why Imam Hussain rose. He said, there's no other option. There's nothing that I could do other than fight against these people which is going to fix the state of the Muslims. Islam is completely disintegrating. And in order to do so, I have to give myself. I have to give my family. I have to give my companions. I have to give the closest people to me. And this is why Imam Hussein alayhi salam sought martyrdom on that day, to save Islam from disintegration. It was completely disintegrating at that time. A man one day, he sees in his sleep, he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And when he sees him in his sleep, he recognizes the majesty of Rasulullah. And he has a conversation with Rasulullah, and while he is asleep, he sees himself in his dream accepting Islam. Saying that, pronouncing the testimony that there is no God but Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah So, when he awakes from the dream, it's such a pleasant experience that he wants to experience it again. So he goes to Medina. And this is during the life of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. He is searching for a remnant of Rasulullah. He's searching for a remnant of the Prophet. He comes to Imam Hussain. He enters the home of Imam Hussain. And he tells Imam Hussain of the dream that he is having. He says, I saw a beautiful dream. Your grandfather, Rasulullah, and I was accepting Islam in front of him and now I am here I am searching for a remnant of Rasulullah something which reminds me I remember his beautiful face his illumination so he accepts Islam in the presence of Imam Hussein and then he asks Imam Hussein he says is there anything that you have a remnant you the grandson of Rasulullah is there a remnant anything which you have left behind which reminds you of the presence of Rasulullah he tells him wait here he brings for him his son, Ali ibn al-Akbar. He says, this is the one who when we want to remember Rasulullah, we look at this young man, Ali ibn al-Akbar. He was the most similar to Rasulullah in his physical appearance, 
in the way he spoke, in the way he presented himself, in his manners and in his attributes. He says, when we miss Rasulullah, we look to the face of this young man. This man, he loses it when he sees the beauty of Ali al Akbar. He says, this, this, this is exactly what I saw in this dream. This face, this is exactly what I saw in my dream. Then Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he turns to him. He says, Ya Hada. He says, you've, you've fallen in love with this young man. He says, I'll ask you a question. What would you do if you had a son like this and someone would harm him? Someone would just prick him in the slightest of way. He says, a, a child like this, one who resembles Rasulullah in every way, I would protect him with my entire life. I would not let anybody harm him. He says, then what would you do if this child was to be cut into pieces? The man begins to weep. Imam Hussain alayhi salam prophesizes, he tells him there will be a day where this, this dear son of mine, he will be taken from me and he will be cut into pieces in front of my own two eyes. Imagine the spirit of this young man as they are on their, their way to Karbala. Ali al-Akbar, he narrates, he says, I turned to my father, Imam Hussain, and I noticed that as he was sitting, he was riding on the camel on the way to Karbala, he kept falling asleep and waking up, falling asleep and waking up. And every time he would wake up, he would say, Imam Hussein would say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. To Allah we belong and to him we return. Ali al-Akbar turns to his father, Sayyidi, my dear Aba Abdullah, why is it that you are crying? Awalasna ala al-haq? What is it? What, what is bothering you? Awalasna ala al-haq? Are we not on the, on the path of truth? He says, yes, we are on the path of truth. Then Ali al-Akbar replies, he says, He says, then we should not mind whether death befalls us or we fall upon death. This was Ali al-Akbar, the young man who on the day of Ashura, when all of the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam fell one after another, Habib ibn al-Zahir, Zuhair ibn al-Qayyim, Al-Hurr ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, Jawn Mawla Abidhar, Wahab al-Kalbi, Junad al-Ansari, Amr ibn Junada, when they fell one after another, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he turns and he begins to call, Ala hal min nasirin yansuruna, Ala hal min dhabbin yadubbu an harami rasulillah, is there anyone to come to our aid? Is there anyone to protect the daughters of Rasulullah? At this point, he calls upon the names of the companions again. Ya Habib, wa ya Burair, wa ya Muslim, the ones who had already given their lives. Stand up, come back, wake up and, and protect the family of Rasulullah. Protect the daughters of Rasulullah. At this moment, when the Imam saw no response, when he saw that the enemy's hearts were as hard as rock, were as solid as the ground, he decided that it was time for his family to go out into battle. The first person who approaches him is his son Ali al-Akbar. Allahu Akbar. How could Imam Hussein alayhi salam give up this young man? He testifies, he says, Wallah, when we used to miss, wa kunna idha shtaqna ila Rasulullah, nadarna ila wajhi hadha al-Qulam. That when we used to long for Rasulullah, we used to look to the face of this young man. At this moment, he prepares him for battle. He embraces him and he begins to weep. He sends him out into the battle and he recites verses of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah astafa Adam wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al-Alamin. Dhurriyatun ba'duha min ba'd. Wallahu sami'un alim. Allahumma ashhad alayhim. Oh Allah, bear witness against these people. فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ خَرَجَ إِلَيْهِمْ غُلَامٌ أَشْبَهُ النَّاسِ خَلْقًا وَخُلْقًا وَمَنْطِقًا بِرَسُولِكَ Oh Allah, bear witness against them. For the man who is emerging against them is the one who is most similar in his attributes, in his traits, in the way he presents himself, in his physical characteristics to Rasulullah. How could you fight against a man who resembles Rasulullah in every which way? Ali ibn Hussein, he goes out into the battlefield and he introduces himself. He says, Ana, Ana, Ana Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali, Nahnu wa Rabbi al Bayti awla bin Nabi. I am Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali. We, by Allah, we are closer, and by the house of Allah, we are closer than you to Rasulullah. أضربكم بالسيف حتى ينثني ضرب غلام هاشمي علوي 
Allah la yahkumu fina ibn da'i. He says, I strike you with my strongest of strikes. He says, I protect the family of my father. I strike until my sword breaks in two. And by God, the one whose father is not known shall not rule over us. Tallah la yahkumu fina ibn da'i. Layla, the mother of Ali al Akbar, she sits inside the tent. And she cannot, she cannot go out in front of the people. She is in despair. She cannot go and look. So Imam Hussein salam stands by the tent. Layla looks to the face of Imam Hussein salam. She wants to see, is his facial expressions changing? All of a sudden she notices that the facial expression of Imam Hussein changes. He has a frown upon his face. She turns him, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, what has happened? Hal usiba waladi? Has anything happened to my son? She says, No, Ya Layla, nothing has happened, but a warrior has come out, and I'm afraid that this warrior will, will be able to overpower my son. She says, What do I do in this case? He turns to her and he says, Ya Layla, pray for your son. For I heard Rasulullah say that the prayer of a mother for her son is answered and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to it. She went inside the tent and she begins to call, Ya Radda Yusuf ila Ya'qub. Oh, the one who brought back Yusuf to Ya'qub, Urdud alayya waladi, bring my son back to me. At that moment, Ali al Akbar comes back with the head of this warrior. He turns to his father, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, Abata, Al Atash Kat Katalani, Wathiklu al Hadidi Ajhadani. This thirst is killing me, and the heaviness of this armor and the sword, it is taking a toll on me. I have brought you the head of this warrior. He said, The princes, they go out, they bring back the heads. They bring back the heads of animals. They bring back all kinds of things with them and they are rewarded with gold. I have brought back the head of this warrior. All I am asking in exchange is a drink of water. The thirst has killed me. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he embraces his son Ali al-Akbar. He tells him, my dear son, look at me. And he opens his mouth. He shows him his tongue. It was like a dry piece of wood. He said, my dear son, I am more thirsty by Allah than you are. Ali al-Akbar, he weeps. This time he goes out into the battlefield with full strength and full determination as he is fighting, ya mu'mineen, against the believers. A man by the name of Munqad ibn Murr al-Abdi, he aims his spear at the chest of Ali al-Akbar. He throws it to him. It strikes him in the chest. The blood begins to fall all over the eyes of the horse he is riding. The horse is confused. And instead of bringing him back to the camp, it takes him straight to the camp of Umar ibn Sa'ad. At this moment, all of the soldiers from that army, they begin to rain down upon him with arrows. One of them strikes him with a sword. One of them strikes him with a spear. One of them strikes him with a lance. Imam Hussein alayhi salam rushes out into the battlefield. Bunayya Ali. Bunayya Ali, who did this to you? Ala dunya ba'daka al-afa. Ali al-Akbar is laying on the battlefield. Imam Hussein alayhi salam embraces him. He places his cheek on the cheek of his son. Bunayya Ali. Ala dunya ba'daka al-afa. My dear son, who am I to live for after you? And then at that moment, he tries to lift the spear out of the chest of Ali al-Akbar. He has no power. He turns to his father, Imam Ali alayhi salam, buried away in Najaf. He tells him, my dear father, it is you who lifted the door of Khaybar with one hand. But did you ever have to lift the spear out of the chest of your son? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu ayya munqalabin yanqalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Brothers and sisters, please stay put. Let us, let us raise our hands. Let us do a short dua. And we have English lamentation, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Let us recite this ayah five times for the speedy recovery of those who are sick and those who need our help. And let us ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless and reward and forgive us إن شاء الله. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 
أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُفْضَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاض الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين